This is probably really predictable, but I'm a huge fan of The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien, and that kind of fantasy in general. Um, I like it because it constructs an alternate reality. <clears throat> One of the main objections I do have, however, to the whole thing is the way in which it splits the universe into good and evil. Now, of course, you could say, oh, well, of course, that's just um, being deliberately childish and making white hats and black hats that we actually need to have a good old-fashioned fairy tale. Um, well, I think that The Lord of the Rings is a lot deeper than that, and it tends to deal with what I suppose one might call uh, the Manichaean or the Catholic sort of view of the universe, in which the universe is actually made up of that which is good and that which is evil. You go into Lothlorien and the elves are good. You go into Mordor and the orcs and Sauron and that sort of thing. These are bad. These are evil things, evil beings. Um, people have criticized the Lord of the Rings as a racist thing, a racist tale for that very reason. There are things, beings there that are fundamentally bad. That's arguable, but that's you know it's one of the things that comes up. And I always thought that the end of the Lord of the Rings, where it looks as though Sauron is destroyed, the world is saved, etc., is kind of empty and hollow. The, how does the, how's the world any better? All you've done is you've eliminated Sauron, and it's just the same old mundane world. Um, but one of the things that I do like about it is the way that it t it examines the idea of um, what would an evil being look like? What would an evil being do, want, etc.? Or even not evil, what would a being, it's an interesting use of language, a being that is in a state of non-being actually seem like? Or what is the state of positive non-being? In other words, you have consciousness, but you have no conception of being itself. You are perceiving things. You are existing as a conscious entity, but there is no sense that you are even remotely capable of being alone with yourself. The elves are portrayed as people who, or creatures or whatever, who want to be more than almost anything else. The world around them is nothing more than a distraction from their blessed sort of utopian state of just existing. All that they want is to just be, and they're getting fed up with Middle Earth because Middle Earth is becoming a complicated place to live in, and they don't want the distractions of having to deal with things like Sauron and orcs and trolls and stuff like that. So they're leaving. They're saying, uh, nah, I've had enough of this. And as a consequence, the, el the elves sort of look a little bit sterile to us. Um, Sauron is sort of the example, the counterexample of non-being, and he's actually described that way in um, the way the scene in which Frodo looks into the mirror of Galadriel, and he sees Sauron for what he is. I'm just going to read a little quote here off my phone. But suddenly the mirror went altogether dark. Frodo's looking into this mirror, sort of a crystal ball as dark as if a hole had been opened in the world of sight. In the abyss there appeared a single eye that slowly grew until it f filled nearly all the mirror. So terrible was it that Frodo stood rooted, unable to cry out or to withdraw his gaze. The eye was rimmed with fire, but was itself glazed, yellow as a cat's, watchful and intent, and the black slit of its pupil opened on a pit, a window into nothing. <laughs> a window into nothing. It, and it, you get the sense that it's a positive nothingness. It's not just an absence of something. It's an actual, positive, tangible nothing. It's consciousness 
utterly devoid of being. There's nothing more than will and will to act upon other things. Um, and one would assume that it's not just, I guess you'd say, Nietzsche's balanced will. In other words, um, we have a will to make other things suffer. We have a will to control other things. We have a will to acquire things to ourselves, riches, uh, possessions, power, etc. But we also have another will where we are um, we have a will to spread goodness or tenderness or joy or love in the world. Um, that's at least what I get out of Nietzsche. It's, uh, we, we have many different wills. We have wills to life, we have wills to joy, etc. But we also have wills to power and all that kind of thing. Sauron doesn't have any of the good will. He's got nothing, utterly nothing, other than I guess the will to power. That's it. That's all that he has. The will to control and to force other things to suffer. Now they're trying to Tolkien's trying to say that this is an evil state, but or maybe not an e evil state, but a very disruptive state that needs other beings to fight. But one would assume that Sauron is a very powerful being who has lost some sort of sense of what he actually is. The mouth of Sauron forgot his own name, one of the black Numenorians. He couldn't even remember what his name was. He was simply, he only existed to serve Sauron. In other words, he was an utter and total slave to Sauron's will. So he was another victim of the loss of being. Sauron himself had no being whatsoever. He was a positive nothing. Um, who only existed in as much as he could act on other things. His own being itself was not sufficient. In fact, one gets the impression that these types of caricatures in the literature would be horrified by the thought of gazing backwards into themselves. Um, in Zapfe's The Last Messiah, our caveman looks back into himself and is driven mad by it. He's driven mad by being, by the realization of being, or in uh, Camus's um, nausea, uh, where uh, our uh, protagonist can't handle the fact that he exists, or he can't even handle the fact of existence. He can't handle the fact of being, or he can handle it, but he doesn't want to. It's disgusting to him. He doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, so there's this sense that there, there's a certain species of non-being or anti-being or counter-being that is utterly undesirable and its only self-antidote or only self-medication, I guess you would call it, is to distract itself by visiting its will upon others. Now, of course that's a caricature. It's, um, you know, the old saying, only unhappy people um, have a true desire to make other people unhappy. Um, and, you know, that's the thing about, you know, we, we assume that Hitler was sick because he simply couldn't leave well enough alone. He had to be out there harming things and hunting other beings and bending other people to his will. And it's very important that Sauron and Hitler and Stalin and uh, Cthulhu and the Cthulhu mythos do these things against the wills of others. It's not enough just to get other things to, or other beings to do as you want them to do. You must make them do it against their will. Um, and that is the only sort of distraction or, or um, the only sort of antidote to their own horror at their own being. Sauron has gone gone so far into a positive state of non-being that he can only gain pleasure or only gain release or only gain purpose or meaning by subverting the wills of other things against their will. Um, he can only be distracted from his own utter non-being by um, visiting himself negatively on other things. Um, 
I wonder what you would call that state, that state that you simply cannot handle the default position, that if you take away all of your distractions, it drives you mad like it does, or kills you like it does in Zopfe's Cavemen in The Last Messiah, or it turns you into something utterly cruel and evil like Hitler or Sauron. What would you call that? I, I don't know, ontophobia? How's that for a crazy word for you? Or mesoontology, the hatred of existence? I don't know. Um, but it does seem to be about as undesirable a state of being as, there's, as, as one is possible to conceive of. Being itself is the problem. Uh, there's a streak of this in my pet sort of Eastern philosophy, Jainism, where it's almost as though one gets the impression that the true horror of existence is existence itself <laughs> in a universe that will always exist. The Jain wheel of existence, the Jain version of samsara, uh, seems to hold that existence, phenomenality, uh, the wheel of existence will continue, has never started turning the wheel of existence and will never stop. It's, it just is. And the only thing to do about that is to get off, to get off that wheel. You can't destroy it. Some people might attempt to destroy the universe or the multiverse or existence itself, but good luck. Um, and Again, the horror of existence is existence itself, and the best thing to do is to cease to exist. Now, I guess that would be mesoontology, I don't know, <laughs> or meso <-philontology? laughs> uh, I don't know what you'd call that, but positive desire for non-existence, for ceasing to have an ontological state, as a counter to a true hatred, fear, terror, horror of existence. You see, when uh, in The Call of Cthulhu by um, H.P. Lovecraft, when the sailors go off to that rock and they find Cthulhu in his cave, or in his tomb, or whatever you want to call it, um, they describe the darkness in which Cthulhu lives, or doesn't live. He's dead, but he's existing, I guess, as a positive darkness. Um, a darkness that has an existence beyond the mere absence of light. And that is a really good metaphor, if you ask me. And it, it's very similar to Sauron. Um, the positive, uh, virulent, active non-existence or non-being. You still perceive things, you're still conscious, but you find that state utterly intolerable. Um, I don't think one can encounter a dilemma more fundamental than that one. Um, Shakespeare, eh? to be or not to be, well, do you have any bloody choice? <laughs>